Okay, welcome everybody. This is my presentation. What is user journey mapping and why should I care? I'm Chad Hester. I'm a web developer of over 20 years. I've been working with Drupal for roughly 12 years. I've been mostly focused on information architecture and UX strategy for the past 10 plus years. I'm also a strong advocate for open source software and the user experience community. Uh, participating, learning, of course. I'm a senior solutions architect at Unleashed Technologies. We're hiring if anybody's interested. So first and foremost, is this a presentation for you? So the things that we're going to review is, well, trying to answer what is user journey mapping and how can this help me improve user experience? Is that the same thing as user stories, user personas, or user flows? Well, let's start with that. How am I going to improve the user experience with this tool? And really, this presentation was born out of some confusion. Some confusion with user personas, user stories, user story mapping. What's the difference there? User flows, user journeys versus user, user journey mapping. So these are each distinct and related concepts that help us improve UX, at least trying to understand them. User experience research is imperfect. It's not trying to be perfect. It's trying to be empathetic. Uh, we want to try to improve and grow, understand different perspectives, and also start with any sort of helpful user experience exercises. And it's a large field. No one person does it all to the best possible way. I mean, you could have psychologists, des designers, engineers. There are a lot of people that can help impact this field. So know where you fit into that know what your talent is and start there. You can always expand out. And if you're not sure where else to start, there's a handy link at the bottom. Uh, we will uh, be sharing the slides afterward. Uh, so let's keep going. So user journeys, what are those? Well, uh, a person moves through some sort of an activity, different steps, and there are different touch points like maybe a newspaper, a TV commercial, maybe a website. And those are the different touch points. They also have different feelings and thoughts at each step. And we want to empathize with those. That's sourced from uh, actual research. And there are different types of people that can have different experiences. So we want to be sympathetic to that. Maybe my experience buying a car is different than my father's experience buying a car. And that's valid. We might just go through different steps and have a different approach and different motivations. But it's still the same process, buying a car. So what's the purpose of user journey mapping? So we just talked about what is a user journey. So a map is actually doing the dedicated uh, user experience research, trying to improve design, analyzing different audience segments, understanding their emotions and different pain points, evaluating the impact of touch points, and sometimes identifying conversion funnels, and in other cases, you already know what they are, improving them. We can reference these later on once they're put together. We can revise them as we change systems or, or things like that, maybe improve our conversations and continue to grow and improve things. So we want to compare a process sometimes also between different types of people to see what sort of accommodations we need to make. So we're gonna come back to user journey mapping in a bit, but we want to establish some, some key differences between other and related things. And some of these things build on top of uh, what we need for user journey mapping. And the first is user personas. So what is that? So a user persona defines and represents an audience segment. It's a fictional character. And we study real users. Um, and sometimes we can method act as a character if we just don't have the ability to research the users, but we do want to prefer talking to people, doing user tests, understanding what makes them tick, understanding the demographic spread for a specific audience segment. That is the better way to inform effective design. But if you just don't have that, can't afford it, method acting is, is better than nothing. And we want to compare experiences of different audience segments. Maybe an out-of-state high school uh, student might have a different experience than an in-state high school student when applying for a student loan. That's, that's valid, and you should be aware of that. And we want to uh, cons consistently use these in any sort of user experience design exercises. So it gives us that stepping stone. And one of those exercises is user journey mapping. 
So with a user persona, we want to start by asking a few questions. These aren't the only questions, but this should help get you going. Who am I? Who is this person? Uh, what does this person like and not like? What motivates them? What frustrates them? What decisions are they able to make? Uh, what is the relationship between this audience segment and the organization that you know, is studying them? Why are they that audience? And, and what do we have to offer them? So just asking yourself those sort of questions can start to paint a picture of who they might be, especially as a reference to you. You're studying them for a reason. Don't just make up a fictional character. Try to have some sort of application as to why you're studying them. And how do we create that user persona? Well, you want to conduct user research, interview them, try to validate your learning. Don't just make assumptions. Use real input. And you can do that with some passive tools. Google Analytics and other analytics tools uh, can help you collect demographic information. Uh, you can do user surveys. You can take a look at things like feedback logs. Maybe there are emails or phone calls or any sort of logs like that, where you can note trends. What are people doing? And try to see those behavior patterns with uh, tools like Hotjar might see uh, heat mapping or other recording. What are people actually doing in a website or whatever it is that they're using? Uh, you can use eye mapping and other things like that when perhaps studying a car. How is somebody using a car and what are they paying attention to? So there are different tools. Just understand what you're studying. And also understand what their job role is. Maybe they're a VP in a company. Maybe they're a salesperson. Maybe they're a construction worker. What, what do they do? What is their salary? You know, if you're asking me to spend money, if I don't really make that much money, I'm going to be really hard pressed to part with it. So just understand what those boundaries are and also try to analyze any of those sort of trends for the audience segment. So as we create these user personas, it's pretty common to create a fictional name. Uh, sometimes you'll use alliterative devices like Michael Member uh, to try to, you know, trigger the brain and to remember who this is and what purpose they serve. Give them an age, and this is based again on research. What's the average age of this person and how are we re representing them? What's their occupation? What's their salary? So that way when you're doing research, that is a representative uh, persona. It's not the only one. You can have several. You can dive down into sub-segments, that's okay. But start with your main use cases. Uh, write down any goals, motivations, a brief bio. Give them a story, and I, we're not talking user stories. This is part of the reason for the cause of difference, but just give them a bio. Relate some of that user persona back to applicable tasks. Remember, you're using this to study and, and apply this through different exercises. So it, it relates to you and your organization and what it is that they can do in different systems, conversations, whatnot. So for example, uh, if somebody's got a family and a busy job, they're more likely to be hasty and impatient. So how does that impact how they're looking at your website? They're not taking their time. So write that down and just keep that in mind whenever you're using those personas. So a few example personas are here. I know the type is super small. That's not the point. The point is just to identify the component parts of what it is that you're seeing. So we have uh, just an, uh, a picture of some of these people. I would encourage greater diversity. We see a lot of white men here and, and one black man in here. Uh, I would encourage diversity where possible, but be honest about your audience segments. Don't force diversity where it truly doesn't exist, but I would encourage that. Identify what the audience segment name is. So Christopher Corporate, as well as corporate member age, location, occupation, income, primary interests. Now this is actually from a study that we did for the National Guard Association of the United States. Uh, so that's why it looks the way it does. We list out a few motivating factors for each one of these people, as well as uh, some sort of a background for them. So that way, if we're doing some sort of a study, we can take a look at this bio and say, well, what decisions would they be more likely to make in this process? Where would they potentially get frustrated or what are, what are their main motivations? So that's how you construct user personas in kind of a nutshell. Of course, do more research if that's what you're trying to do. So how does this compare to user stories? Didn't we just tell a story about a user? Well, kind of, but user stories are a very specific thing in uh, user experience uh, design. So 
uh, uh, is a user journey like a user story? They sound kind of similar in, in words? N no, but they do influence one another. User stories are small tasks. Uh, the smaller, the better. Uh, user stories inform the build strategy and the backlog. Uh, large uh, related groups of user stories are called epics in agile development. And they're critical for agile development to identify uh, things like a minimum viable product and for user acceptance testing. So to define a story, we really need to empathize. Who am I? What am I doing? Why am I doing that? And how is that different from me? So let's break that apart into what the actual story is. Who is doing this thing? What is this person doing? Why are they doing it? So as who, I want to what, so that why. And that's a pretty common format. So that's kind of what we consider the long format for user stories. Uh, so as a high school student, I want to apply for a student loan so that I can attend college. Well, that sounds very similar to the next one, but we have a different audience segment. As a parent, I want to apply for a student loan so that my child can attend college. And this is an important distinction that a lot of times we need to make. So that way we can study the differences between the two and make sure that we build systems accommodating both of those audience segments and those motivating factors. So this is an exercise that you can do to develop user acceptance testing, uh, acceptance criteria for backlog items, that sort of thing. But then that brings us to user story mapping, which is a more specific practice, a, a much broader practice. You can get you know, very granular. But if you're going to do user story mapping, typically you're going to do that as a group. Different people have different perspectives and input, uh, so, you know, subject matter experts on a system. So you want to tap into that. A lot of times we'll start with a white ball, sorry, a white board or a wall with post-it notes. Um, we'll typically also identify, you know, who this thing is for and then map the big picture, go, go broad. And then as we kind of get the sense of breadth, then we go deep for each epic. We'll slice out a release strategy. That's the blue line for an MVP. We'll slice out a learning strategy, smaller experiments to reduce risks. And we'll slice out development strategy to plan what we can build immediately. Now, this may seem very broad stroke what I'm saying here. It is. It's a very specific practice. I'd highly recommend reading the book called User Story Mapping by Jeff Patton. He uh, takes the first chapter and gives you everything that you need to know to immediately get started with a group of people. Now, of course, the whole book is a fantastic read, but if you just read that first chapter, you'll be in pretty good shape understanding how to get started with this. So that's where we're going to leave this. That's user stories and user story mapping. And a lot of times in user story mapping, instead of that long form user story, we can get away with very short user stories. Apply for a student loan, read a course description, check out from a cart. Those sort of things give us a sense of, you know, the verb noun pairs that we can very quickly write as a group to make very rapid progress in defining that user story map. So understand the difference between the two. So how does that tie into user flows? How does all this stuff relate? Well, is a user journey map like a user flow? Well, kind of. Uh, they both describe visually a process. So user flows, there are different types. You can use wire flows, page flows, decision trees. Those are all common examples. Um, then you also have a process. What are the steps, the sequences, the branches? Sometimes you have different decisions. So if yes, go this way. If no, go that way. And you kind of exemplify different decisions. And that's totally fine. You can also use a user flow to evaluate the steps in a process to sometimes make uh, a system more efficient. Now, how that relates to a user journey map is that a user journey map benefits from a user flow. You're only describing the process. And in a user journey map, um, it, it can help inform changes to a user flow. So there are two different diagramming artifacts. Usually you'll start with a user flow, which is what is the process, let's map that out. And then you'll do a user journey map to get in more depth about the empathy. What, what are people feeling? So how do we get there? Where do I start? What choices can I make? What happens next? Is there a goal? <laughs> you know, start with, begin with the end in mind. So we want to map out what those things look like. So let's take a look at some real ones. This is a user journey 
um, sorry, a user flow for uh, National Guard Association of the United States, again, uh, the new membership path. Now you can see a few steps here. Again, it's microtype. We'll share the slides. The main point here is uh, somebody can get through the main navigation or a call to action that's in the global navigation to join and renew. They get to the join and renew page. Uh, they can also look at member benefits, which makes sense if I'm considering membership. You know, I might want to see the benefits. Uh, if I'm an existing member, that might be a completely different process. If I'm a new member, then, you know, selecting that, filling out an application. There's also, in this scenario, a different process for corporate members versus individual members. And there's a bunch of form steps, as well as some uh, micro interactions for error messages and, and an external application for different things. Um, National Guard Association of the United States is a, a national organization and they work with state and territory associations as well. And every state has a different way of handling association memberships just to complicate the matters that much more. Uh, renewing membership is a completely different process, just analyzing the steps there. If the systems change, being aware of those sort of things. And here we also have a, a handful of annotations and, and notes to help us ask ourselves critical questions. Can this change? Is this correct? Uh, what might happen over time as these different systems might evolve? Event registration is another common uh, process that we'll take a look at for most association clients uh, that we work with because it's a huge revenue. Uh, writing to Congress, this one was really interesting because the writing to Congress part was actually handled by an iframe and there are different steps that a person can go through there. But the point is, is that it was an important uh, part of a conversion funnel for this organization. So we studied that, we tried to map it out. And we'll come back to all of these in our user journey maps. But this at least acknowledges what are the different pages and micro interactions that we might encounter and why. So that's, these are called uh, wire flows. So are you feeling lost? <laughs> the best thing to do is start asking questions, really. Um, and most importantly, all of these different parts that we've just been evaluating, they, they are different, but they work together. Uh, user personas help define audience segments and they're used in exercises and research. User stories help define a specific task that we can use for, uh, backlog and user acceptance testing. User story mapping helps us plan an entire agile build and kind of see the forest for the trees. User flows help us visualize a process to see how we might improve things. But then we move over to user journeys, you know, the process that people can go through that's unique to their experience. And then the user journey maps are an analysis of a user's feelings, their thoughts, the touch points through a process so we can identify areas to improve user experience on or off the website. When we go to apply for um, a membership or if we're registering for an event like DrupalCon, you didn't just go to a website and that's it. Well, many of us didn't. We probably had to talk to somebody about the cost of it or we might had, have a conversation with a colleague about it. Those are all valid parts of the experience. So let's talk about mapping user journeys. How do you create a user journey map? Well, I'd recommend starting with a common template. Uh, that way, when you create multiple journey maps, they have a consistent look and feel, and it makes them easier to compile. You wanna reference the user persona, that attributes perspective. You want to document the basic sequence of tasks. That's their process. Not everybody's, but their process. And it's usually divided into stages, not all, all the time, but this is pretty common, especially with conversion funnels. So that would be the awareness discovery, just, you just found out about something or you just discovered something, the interest and consideration, huh, should I do this? Is this for me? What other options are there? And then the evaluation conversion side of things, when you're actually pulling the trigger on things at that point. And you wanna indicate what touch points are coming into play with those things. We also want to take into account any sort of feedback that we've had from people through a certain process. That is, what are their thoughts? What are they saying? What are they feeling? And you can graph that through the process and that will help you understand where they're getting frustrated or where you might make certain improvements. 
how do I use a user journey map? Well, you want to present findings to stakeholders so that way you can get on the same page. So that way when you are making design decisions, it's not coming out of left field. These are founded things. Uh, you're identifying and defining or refining conversion funnels. Uh, you can conduct user tests and interviews to validate these sort of things. Use uh, user stories to identify critical tasks where any missing. Uh, you can create user flows to uh, model improvements before you make uh, design changes. Uh, you can ensure website touch points are optimized for conversion. You know, the areas where you can impact things. And you can also optimize other touch points, like how your salespeople might talk to people in the field, things like that, totally valid. And also discuss ideas to populate the backlog for continuous improvements. Again, it's about empathy. So what is this? Is this for me? How does this make me feel? Do I want or need this thing? What, why do I want to do this? How do I do this? What do others think? So those are all questions that somebody coming to your website or using your product might be asking themselves and you want to be receptive to those questions that they're asking and seeing how you can accommodate them. So are there any good examples of user journey maps? Well, of course there are. There are tons of examples online and there are a lot of tools that can help you with that sort of thing. So we're gonna provide you first with a generic example. And we also have some examples, again, from the National Guard Association of the United States, uh, a discovery effort that we did with them. So our first example, again, I know it's microtype. I apologize for that. So again, take a look at the slides after the presentation if you wanna be able to read this, but we're gonna take a look at the composition of this. So this is a, a user journey map for Michael Member. He is a member. He is 72 years old. So he is right there diving right into retirement age. That's one of his motivating factors. Uh, he, he has an income of about uh, $200,000. His primary interest is sailing. Okay, so he's the CEO of a company in Bethesda, Maryland. And we compose this uh, as a conversion funnel uh, for going to a conference, registering for it. At the very top, you can see the different stages, awareness, discovery, interest, consideration, and evaluation conversion. And in this first row, you can see the different thoughts that he has. So when uh, we scan this from top to bottom, you can see thoughts, process, touch points, emotions at the bottom. And the emotions kind of teeter between uh, neutral, positive, and negative as he goes through the process. So a coworker reminded him about an upcoming conference. He read a conference brochure. Uh, he had a discussion about that conference with the coworker. That's your touch point. So conversations are touch points. A brochure, that's a physical medium. Where, who printed that? Who made that? Who decided the design on that? And his attitude becomes positive. He's excited about the conference. So then he moves into more of the consideration phase. Uh, you know, he wants to attend this conference this year. Uh, he considers attending. He uh, starts to move more to a neutral emotion, you know, planning and reviewing. And then he takes a look online for travel options. Uh, he becomes a bit worried about expenses. You know, he has both the thought and the feeling for that. He reviews different event options. Uh, he talks to coworkers about attendance. So see, there are touch points that are both electronic and human that are valid here. Some of that you have influence over, some of that you do not have influence over, at least not directly, maybe indirectly. He reviews different registration and sponsorship options. Uh, after that point, you know, he, he had some difficulty finding some information, but with some help, he was able to figure it out, register for the event, and then he attends the event. You know, his, his secretary registers him and two employees. Um, and then books travel, happy to see Pierce. So his emotions go up during attendance and, and he even has a tail off at the very end with an interest to return to next year's conference. So through this very simple example, we can see a wave of emotions, thoughts, touch points, and different points in the process. Those points in the process are things that we might have already mapped out in a user flow. A couple other examples, not gonna read the whole thing, uh, are from Nagus um, in GAUS. And uh, in this case, I'm taking a look at an individual member joining, the different processes there. You can see the wave of emotions, uh, the different thought patterns, the different touch points, and the process that they go through. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have the user persona, and we can 
try to use both of these things to create this user journey map. Taking a look at the rest, we've got a corporate member renewing their membership. Different touch points for this process for a corporate member, this corporate member. Uh, we also have a, an event registration, a bit more complex than that first generic example that we had because the process is a bit more involved. And then lastly, I, I do want to hang on this one a little bit because this is actually an example of um, a bit more of a negative pattern. So sometimes in conversion funnels, we want to push towards a positive emotion to uh, create action. In this case, the opposite is true. Writing to Congress is coming from a, a place of being upset about something, pushing to a motivation. Now, we're not trying to make people upset, but that is what actually brings people to write to Congress. So they might have read an article, legislative news, um, at, uh, or on the Nagus website. They may have researched that a bit, uh, seen uh, some commercials on TV about what's going on or a newscast, uh, talked to a few different people, taken a look at uh, a bill going through Congress, and might have been upset about the uh, uh, position that a representative had. Maybe you want to talk to that representative. Well, you can't necessarily talk to a congressperson all the time, so writing to Congress is a facility for that. So um, Maria Media, uh, this person um, that is part of the media audience segment, is the person that we studied here and got to the point where she wrote to Congress and was a bit pensive and eager to see a shift in position, uh, but then excited by peer support and then uh, motivated to submit a letter. And that changed her emotion, the fact that she was capable of doing that, that there was a forum for that, that Nagus gave her that. But it took a negative pattern to bring her to the point of even acting at all. Uh, another one that we studied is the email newsletter. And uh, this was just for a real quick thing. We noticed something happened midstream is that, you know, we're asking people to sign up for a newsletter, but there was no example of the newsletter to set people's expectations. So that was a, a suggestion that we made for Nagus for, their, for the new website so that people can understand what to expect before they sign up for something. So just a quick example of how sometimes these can unearth uh, things that we just may not have noticed before. So to wrap this up, let's talk a little bit about continuous improvements. Uh, we covered a lot of subject matter about user journey mapping and other related or similar things. Uh, but really, let's take a brief minute to acknowledge the learning process. There are different steps or phases. At some point in your life, you didn't know what user journey mapping was. It was unknown to you. Maybe you encountered it. Maybe you read a few articles and became acquainted. Now you're studying it because you're attending something and learning more about it. And I would encourage you, if this is something that can help you either at work or even in your personal life to try to improve things, practice it, become experienced. And then eventually, if it really matters that much to, to you, these are the sort of skills that you develop, you can eventually become a master. And depending on the subject matter, it takes shorter or longer to master certain things. Uh, to continue to learn, find a mentor, attend social events, DrupalCon's one of them. Participate, actually try to get engaged, study and practice, uh, discuss and present, uh, consider new uh, tools and techniques, and then repeat. There are a couple links that we have. I'm not going to read these. You'll see the slides. You can click on the links if you want. But we have a couple resources for user personas. Uh, pretty common uh, places might be things like Smashing Magazine has a lot of good stuff, usability.gov, uxdesign.cc. There are a lot of different websites that are pretty common in the UX field that have really fantastic articles. So here's some for user personas, uh, as well as some for user stories and user story mapping. Related, but not the same. Uh, user flows, tons of information on user flows and how you can actually approach uh, plotting out processes. User journey mapping. Uh, there's a lot more than this. These are the three that really stood out to me is really valuable. And uh, yeah, what did you think? Do you have any questions? And of course, you can evaluate this session as well uh, uh, at this link and pull up the uh, session link and there should be a button there to, to evaluate this. So any thoughts, questions, or anything like that? What right. kinds of tools do you use most frequently for creating user journey maps? OK, yeah, that's a good question. So. Uh, for user journey maps, um, I have used Illustrator 
you know, everybody knows Illustrator from Adobe. Um, I've used Lucid Charts, by far one of my favorites. Uh, it's it's kind of like Visio, but it's an online tool. It's cross-platform, so it's pretty easy. Uh, it's not expensive. It's not a free tool. Um, I have also used Affinity Designer, which is a cheaper Illustrator clone, if you will. Um, and those have been the primary tools that I've used, but mostly because I can start with a template. Does that answer your question? Yes. All right. Uh, any other questions? Okie dokie. Uh, what situations do you find yourself normally creating user journey maps in? Oh, yeah, that's that's really good. It's, it's not always a tool that works in all situations, but it is a valuable tool when you're trying to make improvements. So I, I would say the most common would be uh, when you have conversion funnels, uh, you have some sort of long stream um, process. It's not just, you know, one specific process, but it's, it's where you really want to study uh, what's going on in this process for different people. Um, trying to create empathy across those differences. Uh, I think a good example that I like using, well, I'll use two examples actually. Um, one might be a university. So they have incoming students and you might be studying, okay, how are parents applying for student loans? How is a student applying for student loans? How might that be different for each of them? Where can I help improve that process? But you can even get more granular than that, like in-state versus out-of-state tuition. Another example is, that I like using is uh, perhaps um, I want to buy a car and I might go online. I might, um, I might not ever even test drive the thing. I might just really like it that much. Um, I personally, I like test driving it, but maybe some people just want to buy everything online. That's valid. You know, um, my father, who's, you know, a baby boomer, might have a completely different experience. Maybe he's old school, goes to the car lot, talks to the salesperson, test drives a few cars, um, and, and maybe waits to figure out his financing, then goes back and, you know, buys it. That's a different experience. And there might be similarities in, at certain points, but it's, it's not where it's similar, it's where it's different that you do multiple user journey maps. Uh, so there's, there's some pretty common examples, but um, yeah, it's when you're improving user, uh, sorry, con conversion funnels, and uh, when you're just trying to analyze uh, common activities, that don't just have to do with a website. As you can see, different touch points might be, you know, like TV commercial, magazine ad, uh, conversation, uh, you know, attending a conference and talking to an exhibitor, um, not just websites. So just understanding how a, a user journey for a person unfolds and then studying that for the sake of mapping it to make improvements to first, the most common use cases. And then if you're that big, maybe more fringe cases, like maybe Microsoft Office has a lot more depth in what they're studying for their website to attract multiple audiences, you know, academic, professional, all those things. Any other questions? Where do you usually gather your information and research for creating these journeys? Oh yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I would say the simplest answer is wherever you can get it. <laughs> but uh, more specifically, um, I like to divide it into two buckets um, with a third outlier, uh, but two main buckets. The first is what I consider passive research, uh, studying things like heat maps, uh, Google Analytics or other analytic tools, things that you're not talking directly to a human being. You're looking at the results of many human beings doing something. That's fine. Next is more active engagement. That could be user surveys, user interviews, user testing, things where you're getting very direct feedback from people and you know that there's enough of a sample set to stay within um, a reasonable you know, standard deviation to inform design decisions. That's the most preferred and most recommended. And then the last one, uh, why I consider kind of an outlier is this idea of method acting. You know, you're trying to empathize deeply with them, but you aren't them. It's not really the best way to do things because you're pretending and it's not recommended to make design decisions off of assumptions. So that's not validated learning and that's, you know, should be frowned upon. But those are the common sources, uh, but I couldn't understate it. Talk to people, that is the best source. 
Any other questions? Okay, so we'll wrap it up. Thank you all very much for listening to me rattle on. Again, if you have any questions for me beyond this, please seek me out. I'm uh, Chad Hester. I work for a company called Unleash Technologies. You can certainly find me there. There's a mouthful of an email address uh, that I won't even bother spitting out, but you can find me there. Um, I am also Chad K. Hester on Twitter, if you want to try to find me there. I'm Chad Hester, no K in the middle, Chad Hester on Drupal.org if you want to find me through there. Probably easiest to do that. Uh, and thank you very much for attending my session. <laughs>